Oh, good evening. I'm David Feldman. I'm the uh, director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism at Birkbeck, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this Pears Wiener lecture uh, this evening. It's a particular pleasure because I, I, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Schuller Springorum, who is the uh, director of the Center for Research on Antisemitism at the Berlin Technical University, and really has, um, since I've been director of the Pears Institute, I've, I've, I've got to know uh, Stephanie and really have grown to admire and appreciate her uh, her leadership in the field, uh, her leadership as director of the institute in Berlin, but also as a historian who has written on German Jewish history in the 19th and 20th centuries, and has also written um, on uh, the German involvement, German involvement in the Spanish Civil War. This evening, uh, Stephanie is going to talk on the witness and the Holocaust, oral testimonies, and... Yeah, thank you very much, David. It's um, always a pleasure to be in London, of course, and a special pleasure to be at the Pierce Institute, our befriended institution, so to speak, here in the city. But for the purpose of this lecture now, I would like to take you back to where I come from, to Berlin, namely to the center of Berlin, <laughs> Uh, where not far from Alexanderplatz, you can find a monu monument, a memorial dedicated to what is known as the women's protest on Rosenstrasse in 1943. It reads on the monument, the power of civil disobedience and the power of love overcome brutal dictatorship. So, wow, you wonder, wasn't it the Red Army in the first place that liberated Berlin from the power from the power of brutal dictatorship. But um, then you start to wonder, what does it mean to have this here in the middle of the German's capital, a memorial that repeats a certain wishful thinking, I would say, as far as one of the few acts of internal German resistance is concerned. In order to refresh your memory on the Rosenstrasse um, account, let me just shortly give you some basic idea of what happened there. On February 27, 1943, the Gestapo carried out a brutal large-scale arrest across Germany of more than 10,000 Jewish German men, women, and children. In Berlin, between 8 and 9,000 were taken into custody, including some 2,000 individuals living in what the Nazis called mixed marriages. They were interned in the building at Rosenstrasse 2-4, uh, administrative center of the Berlin Jewish community. During the following week, many of their relatives, men, women, and children, gathered there to protest several days against the arrests of those um, inside the building. They got, the exact number of protesters is not known, but probably amounted at best to not more than about 200, which is still a large number given Berlin in the middle of the war. Those interned in the building were gradually released, the first, on, first people on March 1st and the last probably on March 12th. <coughs> this Rosenstrasse protest was long considered the prime <coughs> example, indeed the only instance of a successful resistance against the anti-Jewish policies of the Nazi state. Now, several historians, among them especially my colleague Wolf Gruner, were quick to question this interpretation quite early on. In the mid-1990s, Gruner presented documentation, files from the Gestapo and other offices, which proved that the aim of internment was not to deport the detainees at Rosenstrasse. Rather, the main purpose of their arrest was to check their so-called racial status, which in this case meant most particular the existing mixed marriages. Another secondary aim was to recruit replacement personnel for Jewish institutions in Berlin, so that their staff members who were not living in a mixed marriages could be deported, a total of some 450. 450. 
Though this initially remained a debate defined largely among historians, Margarete von Trotter's film Rosenstraße, which was shown in movie theaters across Germany in 2003 and also in an English version here and in, in the US, became in Germany a box office hit and sparked a passionate debate. That debate was conducted now not only in, an academic, in academic journals, but overflowed into German newspapers and internationally into, onto the internet. <clears throat> Finally, it appeared as a focus at a large convention, including a special panel discussion organized by our Center for Research on Antisemitism, the Jewish Museum in Berlin, and the Memorial for German Resistance. So what was at issue here in this debate? The film had once more presented in a quite compelling dramatic form the thesis of the successful female resistance and protest on Rosenstrasse based on several different descriptions, which in turn were based largely on contemporary witness testimony from within or around the events of Rosenstrasse. Yet the women and youngsters who assembled then outside the building had no idea about the actual plans for persecution and the decrees of the Nazi regime. They stood out there day after day protesting in public against this regime, which required great courage. And they succeeded because the internees, in their perspective, because the internees were indeed soon released. To that extent, the subjective perception of those involved at the time actually tells a quite different story from that contained in the files of the perpetrators. And this was interpreted by some historians as the whole real truth. At the same time, these historians, along in the, in the public sphere with Margarete von Trotter and several women journalists, launched a massive critique against Wolf Gruner and others, accusing them of falsifying history in their, their one-sided and blinkered fixation solely on the written files of the Nazi authorities. So far, so good, or maybe not so good, but at least open to discussion and negotiation, I would think. However, this debate quickly acquired another and very unpleasant aftertaste, namely the charge that it was typically German to rely solely on written files of the perpetrators and to ignore the voices of the victims. These Jewish voices, it was stated, were taken seriously in the main solely by Jewish historians. So very clearly in this argument we can find Methodological questions were, that methodological questions were intermixed in an ex explosive mesh with questions of politics of identity and memory. And this melange could not be found just in a few relevant discussion forums on the internet, but rather was also broached in the debate by serious colleagues again and again, likewise in other contexts, and still continues to be. So what is really at issue here? I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about this question, which is central, I think, for research on national socialism and the Holocaust, and beyond that too, as general historical research. And as a well-behaved historian, I want to do this very historically, in this case, in a frame of the history of scholarship, asking who, when, with what source material, collected, reported, researched, and made statements about what today we call the Holocaust or the Shoah. And my hope is that through this long march down several decades, in the end we will be able to make clear, or I will be able to make clear just how subjective, how much bound up with time and context our respective interpretations actually are. Well, that's a truism, of course, but maybe um, it's not so easy to really grasp what it means when we are dealing with a topic that is so emotionally loaded as this one. While the perpetrators, as we, know, as we all know, tried right down to the end to conceal their murderous actions behind the screen of an euphemistic and bureaucratic language, the victims, right from the start, sought not only to give testimony, but to rescue evidence to substantiate what was occurring before their disbelieving eyes. This is true for German um, chroniclers like Viktor Klemperer or Kurt Rosenberg, whose Hamburg diary has just been edited, I think, last week, as well as for the members of the Sonderkommando at the crematoria in Auschwitz, who buried their notes and descriptions in the hope that one day they might be dug up by someone. And today we can read in Walter Zwiebacherow's impressive documentation 
these are my last words, letter from the Shoah, how men, women and even children tried shortly before their certain death to leave at least testimony of their existence in order in this final way to give testimony to posterity regarding the crime. Laura Jokosch, whose dissertation dealt with the work of the Jewish Historical Commissions in Liberated Europe, points out that the striking need to write down and preserve their suffering immediately or right after liberation, to record the names and numbers of dead, was also nourished by older, especially East European traditions of memory, Jewish traditions of memory. <clears throat> Those traditions had, for example, after the pogroms in the Russian Empire or later in the Ukraine, also sought right after the events to carefully document the violence and name the number and the names of the victims. Probably we could even go further back in history to the medieval Yiskor books and interpret, interpret this form of individual testimony as a kind of counter history written by a minority from the ground up, a minority that in this way resisted for centuries the dominant historical discourse of the ruling majority. It is at least quite certain that Emanuel Ringelblum, to whom we owe the extensive archive on the Warsaw Ghetto, saw himself precisely in this line of in the line of this Eastern European Jewish tradition, which to a certain extent had been rendered scientific or academic by the YIVO um, in the 1930s. As a trained historian, Ringelblum tried at the same time to document the reality around him in as rich a perspective as possible, including numerous numerous facets. For that reason, we can find in his Onek Shabbat archive assembled by a team under his direction, both. We find official documents of the German persecutors or of the Judenrat, along with numerous first-person documents of various and sundry forms. Ringelblum was convinced that only in this manner, in an overall view of source materials from the most different origins, both from perpetrators and victims, could historical reality be perceived and analyzed. I quote, comprehensively, understandably and objectively, as he put it. Ultimately, the few survivors of the ghetto uprising in Warsaw who had worked closely together with him picked up this threat of inquiry immediately again after liberation. They collected reports on people's experiences from children and adults in Poland and the DP camps and took this along with them whenever possible to Palestine and later Israel. There too, people initially trusted, especially the spoken word, the individual witness report of one's own experience. They asked the surviving members of the Zionist resistance groups who gradually migrated into the country to record their experiences, not only in writing, but also to pass on in spoken form. In this way, on numerous lecture tours through mandatory Palestine, contemporary witnesses from 1941 on reported in the Yishuv in Palestine on the persecutions and very soon also very concretely on the mass murders in Poland and the Soviet Union, as they spoke to organizations, politicians, and in the kibbutzim. In a very moving essay, the Israeli historian Dina Porat describes the phenomenon that each and every contemporary witness report was listened to and received by the public as though people were hearing it for the first time, hearing for the first time about the details and the sheer horror of the mass murder, although it can be shown that this was certainly not the case, that they had heard it before and before and listened to lectures. Probably the need then was, as Porat suggested, to have this repetition, people needed to hear again and again from someone who had been there. They had to receive direct testimony until their own minds could begin to slowly observe the monstrosity of the crime, or even simply to be able to believe it at all. Perhaps I thought when reading Porat's essay, traces of this phenomenon are still present today in the immense felt need for authentic, if possibly visually conveyed witness reports with which we have been confronted now for several decades in the media. And just perhaps in a further quite speculative thought, I wish to share perhaps the now so massive and uh, ubiquitous um, availability of these video interviews today with their witness reports adhering to a distinctive kind of aesthetics and manner of narration, 
Perhaps this has led to a situation where in the last one or two years, specifically these very early oral history and documentation pro projects for decades eclipsed into the shadows and forgotten have now again resurfaced on the radar screens of research. Because there are like several PhD dissertations and books and documentations that have been edited lately on that topic. Between 1945 and 1949, a total of about 15,000 interviews, 13,000 in Poland, Germany, and Hungary alone, were carried out with survivors and recorded in one way or the other. The perhaps most exciting of these projects was the interview series with an ethnographic psychological orientation conducted by David Boder, who carried out a total of 130 interviews in 1946 in nine languages, recording these on steel wire using a then very modern wire recorder. These wire recordings still <clears throat> exist today and they are available on the internet by, uh, if you go on the website of the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, you can listen to these voices. And these voices, they clash with our accustomed forms of reception in two ways. For one, the voices are all of young people. And when listening, you feel almost physically, I think, just how young the survivors were. Or seen from another vantage, it was mainly the young, of course, who were able to survive. And second, these are narratives to a certain extent in the rough. They are not closed and completed stories that form part of a larger life history, at whose end a person tells a tale, so to speak. But rather, they represent a total rupture without meaning, devoid of reconciliation, mission, as many contemporary stories are often marked with. Those who speak there are not, or not yet once again, subjects of their own story. And this is perhaps the most impressive aspect, in my mind, uh, to this early pioneering collection by Boder. Soon after the mass murder, it was probably clearer to those who were trying to document events, if not to understand them, that despite all their effort and thousands of interviews, that they would never penetrate to its inner core. I will return to a Boda interview in my conclusion, which underscores that. And I've taken time to describe this project in some brief detail, because I think that pre precisely through the contrast, as I see it today, some of the pitfalls of our current ways of engaging and wrangling with the topic might become a bit clearer. When today we say witness or contemporary witness in Germany, Zeitzeuge or Holocaust, we tend almost automatically to think of some aging individual sitting before a blue television background in a studio, telling a stark story that goes back many decades and telling a narrative that naturally has been shaped by the intervening decades, of course. As my humble colleague Ulrike Uright once put it, biographical narrative is always a site of individual and collective production of meaning. <coughs> Thus, the survivors today participate <coughs> on the last decades, participated in a survivor's discourse, their own or that of their family, their village, but they are not experts for the history of the camps, the Shoah, or of National Socialism. In the early projects of collecting testimony and documentation right after the war's end, what was central was less the writing of history. It was more about a kind of memorializing, memorializing remembrance of the dead and the collection of evidence for legal persecution of the culprits. But precisely here at this point in the legal preparations for persecution of the mass murder, for a long period, eyewitnesses, especially the so-called Betroffene in German, personally directly affected, which is in Germany, in German euphemistic term, and popular use particularly for Jewish victims, especially those were more or less deemed undesirable as sources. It is well known that the organizers, for example, of the Nuremberg trial play, um, played, a, played great value in proving the, placed a great value in proving the guilt of the defendants by their own documents. And they tended to do so almost totally without witness testimony. In addition, what we understand today as a Holocaust was at that time not the central focus of investigations against the accused at Nuremberg. In the Frankfurt-Auschwitz trial, witnesses were included in the argument of the prosecution, though largely for the purpose of identifying the perpetrators and not to report their own suffering or that observed and suffered by others. <clears throat> 
That is, they were not asked to give testimony about what was done to them. In the Eichmann trial in Israel, shortly before Frankfurt, it had been just the opposite, since there was no need to identify Eichmann, of course. The 108 witnesses for the prosecution had been so selected as to report on a specific aspect of the continent-wide murder operation, thus making clear its monstrous contours and scope. For historical research, or more precisely for source material genesis, the Eichmann trial was fundamental in that, for the first time, it also gave a social sounding board to victims who had not been active in Jewish organizations as <laughs> resistance fighters or partisans, but were rather just ordinary people, ordinary victims, so to speak. Already just a few days after the trial commenced, people were standing in line to be allowed to give testimony, which was naturally not possible for all and everyone, but this need to give testimony then expanded the oral history department at Yad Vashem significantly, providing new documentation with which, with, with which we still work today. This oral history department had been established as a section at Yad Vashem in 1955 and saw itself very consciously as a continuation of the early Jewish, early Jewish documentation projects. It was headed by Rachel Auerbach, uh, associate of Emanuel Ringelblum, and one of the few survivors, and its main aim was to build an extensive collection of documentary material, oral history material. At the same time, in Israel, in the initial decades after the creation of the state, the focus at Yad Vashem in historical research as well as in public memory was clearly oriented to the perspective of the resistance fighter, the testimony of those women and men who had actively opposed the murder operations. And to the internal Jewish dispute and confrontations with those who in the Jewish councils and other offices who had attempted to confront and deal with the German practice of persecution in another way and to save life in other ways. If I can formulate this in a cautious manner, some of you might recall the Kastner trial, Kastner who had managed to save lives of some hundred Hungarian Jews by negotiating with the Nazis and who, went, who was trialed for this in 52 and who was after he was released, was murdered on the streets in Tel Aviv in 57. To put it differently, in Israel's first 20 to 30 years, central was the politics of memorialization and the repetition in this context of the internal Jewish struggles of the nine of the years of persecution, while the greater majority of non-heroic survivors were left to grapple with their memories alone. This began slowly to change after the Eichmann trial and the confrontation immediately thereafter with the ideas of Hannah Arendt and Raoul Hilberg. It is true that initially, initially the Israeli reaction, and not just in Israel, lay in further emphasis on research and popular, um, popularizing diverse facts of Jewish resistance in order in some way to counter Arendt's elite charges of collaboration. But gradually, the experience of the ordinary victims came into clearer focus. What was called civil resistance, internal Jewish solidarity, and reactions to the persecution. This is reflected very nicely in two conferences held at Yad Vashem, while in 1968 there had been an international conference on Jewish resistance. The next key conference in 74 was dedicated to the more general theme, the catastrophe of European Jewry, facts, responses, and <coughs> answers, or something like this. A preliminary final point reached by this development was marked by the movie Shoah of Claude Lanzmann in 1985, which was praised especially in Israel as a finally a public recognition of the suffering of the ordinary victim instead of the heroism of the fighter. And this, by the way, is no coincidence, because if you look at the original interviews which Lanzmann filmed, and the list of interviewees who do not appear in the film at all and the parts he left out, whole interviews and part sections of interviews, it becomes very clear that he did not take into consideration anything that had anything to anyone or anything that had anything to do with Jewish agency, with Jewish reaction, action, activism, let alone resistance. He wrote in his memoirs that what was important for him at that time was to make a movie about death the dead and the dying, thus roughly going on from the point, going on from the point which David Boder had reached and stopped at in his path-breaking analysis and interviews 30 years earlier. <clears throat> 
the Israeli or perhaps more broadly the Jewish perspective on the Holocaust has had thus expanded in this period, in this period, opening up slowly to include all the victims, but had centered at the same time mainly on the testimony of the survivors. Only a later generation of Israeli historians, among them my much respected colleague David Bankir, whose untimely death we still mourn, began in the 1980s to deal with the five of the perpetrators, exploring on the basis of this documentation the motives and actions of the murderers and their accomplices. By contrast, in my country, in Germany, the developments went into exactly the opposite direction. To be sure, here, too, Initially, there were collection projects to gather the report of survivors, but more in the Soviet zone and the early GDR than in West Germany. There, in the Soviet zone, um, relatively soon after the wars end, a number of brochures were published with, which, with reports from the concentration camps, which focused especially on communist resistance and, somewhat like in Israel, centered on the active fighters and their heroic deeds. In both German states, the juridical preparation of Nazi crimes and court proceedings was a major focus, if at all. And I will not go into any detail here on that because it's a different story. But as I said, these procedures did not include the statements of the victims and their arguments for prosecution until relatively late in the process and then still with hesitation, like in the 1970s or 80s. Historical research in Germany, both West and East, was not particularly engrossed with the topic of the mass murder of the European Jewry in the first decades after the war. The historical guilt tended to look more, if at all, at the collapse of, of, the, collapse of the Weimar Republic, the workers' movement, and the question of the national socialist takeover of power, communist resistance in the <coughs> East, and with some hesitations, forms of conservative dissent vis-a-vis -vis the regime. German Jewish or Jewish historians living in Germany after the war, like Josef Wolf or Hans Lamm, who dealt in a more eclectic manner with the <clears throat> persecution and mass murder, were marginalized in the 1950s and 60s. Their books were hardly printed and let alone even less read. It was not until the late 1960s and 70s and the upsurge in research on social history that a critical confrontation with Nazi rule itself, the functionaries, the elites, and those who profited came you know, into the focus. In regard to research on national socialism, it culminated in the famous dispute between intentionalist and functionalist. This is also not of interest today, but what is of interest are two aspects of this debate. Even in this debate, the mass murder itself, especially the events in the East, in, the East, in Eastern Europe, and the camps, played almost no role in historical research, well down into the 1980s, even early 90s. It was viewed as a fact, and historians sought to explain the path that had led there. But it was not considered in Germany a historical object of study in its own right, so to speak, a topic with its own salience and gain for knowledge. Coupled with this was an extensive disregard for the perspective <coughs> of the victims in marked contrast with the apologetic writings by high-ranking Nazi officials who were not considered too subjective, but I will talk about this later. In order to make clear how people <coughs> thought back then in Germany, let me share with you an anecdote from my own personal experience from the early 1990s. I had finished my dissertation on the history of the Jewish community in Königsberg between 1871 and 1945, based on a broad corpus of documentation, including Jewish community files, government files, newspapers, memoirs, and interviews. But for the chapter on the Nazi period, there, was hardly, there were hardly any state government files existing since these had been destroyed during the war in East Prussia. And for that reason, my second reader, Hans Mommsen, one of the most famous historians at that time in Germany, he recommended that I leave out the chapter altogether. And he said, look, it's almost based solely on witness accounts. It's nothing substantial, and we won't learn anything which is new, what would be new. Um, probably Hans Mommsen, for whom, in other respects, I have great admiration to make this clear, would say the same thing today. But most of his colleagues would not. But for many years, this specific attitude left its heavy imprint on historical inquiry on national socialism in West Germany. And precisely here lies 
in the 1970s and 80s lie the basis for the criticism mentioned earlier that the Germans are only interested in fires related to the perpetrators. In my view, the constructed contrast or antagonism, namely that there was a typically German and a typically Jewish form of historical inquiry into the Holocaust, was something the generation of Mommsen, that is the generation of the great post-war German social historians, in a certain way had brought upon themselves. In the famous correspondence between Martin Broschardt and Saul Friedländer in the mid-1980s connected with the German Historikerstreit, <laughs> This assumption, which until then had never been publicly stated, was then explicitly broached. Borchardt stressed in a friendly and understanding tone that Friedländer, as a Jewish historian, was simply much too personal, betroffen, too emotionally engaged and caught up in Jewish mythical memoir, memory to be able to approach this historical material, these events with proper objectivity. But by contrast, the professional German historians could approach this material objectively, so goes Broschard, and were involved with correct historical inquiry based on hard facts of the perpetrator files. As absurd as this may sound to today's ears, this was very seriously intended back then. And it took another 20 years until Nicolas Berg, in a probing analysis, clearly dissected this cult of objectivity of this Hitler Jugend generation of German historians, seeing it as a means of self styling identity and self description, psychologically, psychologically perhaps necessary at that time, but academic, academically now quite out of, out of fashion. <laughs> So what we have in Germany, as in Israel, with a reverse polarity, so to speak, is an approach to history that is closely bound up with generations and experiences. The younger generation of researchers, roughly those born between 1960 and the early 1970s, turned with great energy in their own studies to the memory of the victims. This turn naturally was not coincidental, but can only be understood against the backdrop of a general historical paradigm shift when in the late 1970s and early 80s, the history of everyday life gravitated to the front and center stage of historical interest, and questions were raised once again about identities and mentalities. The history of Jews in Germany also re-emerged on the, onto the radar screen of inquiry at that time very slowly, but not coincidentally, once again via the historiographic detour of local history. Fueled by a high level of political and moral impetus, an alternative local history research, a reconstituted Heimatforschung, so to speak, closely connected to the British um, history workshop movement, based mainly in local, in there again, history workshops and commit among committed teachers and archivists, began to dig right where they were standing in a shift to place-based inquiry. And in these excavations underfoot, what came first to light, not surprisingly, was a local brown past. Persecution and resistance, slave laborers and concentration camps became the most frequent topics in the late 1980s. And ni no, more in the, in the 1990s. And in this context, interest surged in the memories of those formerly persecuted. The dom dominant interest of this new generation lay, as in the general, generational cohort before it, clearly in the question, how could this happen? But now what was important was the localized perspective, to grasp the mechanisms of the destruction of Jews from the vantage of looking at the local space, of place-based biography. And to do this, researchers interviewed the few survivors they could find and with difficulty managed to contact. Trips were organized for survivors back to their former hometowns, and in many localities this was even institutionalized. This turn spawned numerous small interview projects, some of which fortunately are still in existence, such as the Workshop of Memory in Hamburg, which was this, with its archive of more than 1,000 interviews of Hamburg Jews. At the same time, that is in the late 70s and 80s, and as a result of the TV series Holocaust, focus on contemporaries who were witnesses to persecution was experiencing a huge upswing internationally. 
In 1979, the Fortunov Video Archive at Yale University was established explicitly in order to counterpose, as I said, the authentic voices of the survivors to the increasing fictionalization of the topic via film and television, already in 79. <clears throat> and also, as I said, in 79, for the simple reason that soon the survivors would not be no more. Time was running out. In the meantime, until today, more than 4,400 video interviews with survivors, many several hours in length, were gathered together, given keywords and open, open to access online. This is also true for the largest and best known of these projects, the Visual History Archive of the Shoah Foundation, which Steven Spielberg initiated after the close of filming Schindler's List. It's interesting that in both cases, it was a movie that initiated these um, uh, video arc as these witness archives, or a history archive. As many of you might know, the Spielberg archive now has collected some 52,000 interviews and is likewise accessible in various institutions in, Ger in Germany and all over the world and is much used. Southampton University historian Tony Kushner recently noted that the imperative re of remembrance springing from quite noble motive leads to collecting more and more, yet without thinking sufficiently, or sometimes even not at all, about what people should actually do with these growing mountains of material. But Kushner reminds us that this remains a key question for future historical inquiry, and not only, I'd like to stress, for the writing of history, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, for the future perception of history. But let me first comment on the writing of history. If we take oral history serious as a, method, as a method, then we know that the interviews generated in this way are always the product of a specific context of communication, the interaction between the interviewer and the interviewee, in a specific, and in a specific setting, at home or elsewhere, for several hours continuously or in parts, all this impacts on the narrative and must, of course, be taken into consideration, quite apart from other factors, like when the interview occurs in a person's life history, etc., etc. When placed in an archive and stored, the interactive dynamic character of the production of an oral history source is transformed into a static document. It is torn from its communicative context and thus is no longer open to an analysis in the original sense of oral history. Nonetheless, the interviews naturally remain useful likewise for historians, especially since digitalization, sequencing and online research seems to ex extend a veritable invitation to their perusal. However, you have to be careful, I think, about using them as a one-to-one -one illustration for a specific topic. And this is, as far as I can see, how they are being used. I mean, you write about Treblinka, and then you go arrival Treblinka, and clack, and then you get all the interviews. And I think this is very difficult. Um, of course, for this reasons, but also for the fundamental fact that in these interviews, content is heavily shaped. Only those experiences are available which in a specific biographical <coughs> moment have been transformed into memory that can be talked about. As I see it, this is precisely the place where academic encounter with this immense corpus should begin its work, with questions about the construction of memory in a specific context according to discursive and linguistic patterns, which language is being used, by the way, is also important, and the media-linked or social influences impacting on all this. This, then, is naturally especially striking when you have more, and you can see it as it's, it's especially interesting for historians, when you have more than one interview with the same person from different times and can compare the two. My colleagues in Hamburg, Ulrike Jureit and Linda Arpa, they did this once. They had an interview of the same person for several decades, three interviews. And of course, this then is, is another, they, you ask different questions then, but then I think it's very, this material can be very useful. Ultimately, it also means to quote Tony Kushner again, to approach these source materials most particularly in a qualitative way, recognizing from the start their inherent disorder and wildness, as he called it, and the impossibility of taming individual memoirs, of domesticating them according to our convenience. <clears throat> 
No matter how critically I view the way we must deal with these now ever more massively available oral history sources, I'm naturally aware that the, I quote, uh, uh, dissertation has been written in Luxembourg, that the academic and most especially social recognition of contemporary witnesses as authentic and legitimate witnesses of history is very positive and welcome. But I think we should also be aware of the dangers lurking there when contemporary history or histor history as a whole becomes something which is conveyed only and primarily subjectively as an ensemble of individual experiences and wherever possible in multimedia form. Some like the French psychoanalysis and survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald, Anneliese Stern, view, also view this development rather critically. And, um, I would like to quote her, what she said some years ago. We are expected, we are urged to testify before it is too late. Yet, what knowledge do they hope to gain? Where is all this listening to survivors leading to? Towards sound bites, I fear, which future generations will play with and enjoy. It is happening already. End of quote. Well, I will not go into this um, topic of what it means for education, but maybe we can leave this for the discussion. As for historical sciences, we, I think, have to ask ourselves again and again just the same question. What is what we actually learn in concentrating on witness accounts? The voices of the victims, as my colleague Mark Roseman noted a few months ago in a conference in Berlin, tells us the voices, they tell us a lot about the how, how things were experienced, but they tell us virtually nothing about the why. And Donald Bloxham <laughs> recently stressed once again that it's crucial to know the deeds and the doers thereof if you want to better understand how genocide really happens. Daniel Goldhagen, Saul Friedländer, Christopher Browning, and many others have shown that the perspective of the victims can also tell us something about the perpetrators and the spectators and the profiteers, about their motives, their hatred, their lust for blood, their disgust, or their indifference. But they simply cannot constitute an exclusive source, I think. And at the same time, we should not forget that we can find information about the victims' experiences also in perpetrators' files. To quote Wolf Gruner again, who wrote an article recently on Jewish reactions to persecution, to early persecution in Berlin in the 1930s, he used police diaries, um, which is like a perpetrator files, and he found a huge amount of spontaneous individual resistance and protest and courage by Berlin Jews, which we wouldn't know, would not know about if we wouldn't have these files. But of course, as far as the perpetrators and their experiences, motives, etc., is concerned, we have an obvious problem, namely that there are no statements about this by them, by the perpetrators themselves, which are not self-styled and shaped by personal interest to a very high degree. Paradoxically, here we actually must depend on the files, the memoranda, the reports and descriptions from the time itself in order at least to analyze the intentions, plans and actions of the perpetrators, if not their underlying motivation. Because quite logically, there are no statements by them in the public arena which cannot be viewed against the backdrop of, of a possible criminal persecution. And this is true of the well-formulated apologetic self-descriptions of Albert Speer or Werner Best, <clears throat> as well as a testimony in the dock by some ordinary concentration camp guard in a court proceeding. To make this a little bit clearer, uh, I will allow me a brief detour to, detour to Spain, my second area of research. Two years after Franco's death in 1977, a movie appeared in a documentary in the theaters across Spain, La Vieja Memoria, The Old Memory. And there you can watch fighters from the Spanish Civil War talk about their experiences and with protagonists from all the different political camps. And you can listen and watch with astonishment as old phalangist, fascist, and monarchists tell about torture and killing, how hard it was for them in the beginning, how much fun at times, and on occasions how disgusting and how in the end they just got used to it. An elegant elderly gentleman says, being filmed in his living room, well, I shot the rats just like I used to shoot rabbits. So the legal processing of the crimes, or at least the threat of that, which as we know have ne has never existed in Spain, prevented in Germany the formation of spaces for authentic personal statements by the culprits. Okay, we can evaluate this fact 
as we like, um, but it means that still until today we are all directed to literary fantasies like that of Jonathan Little in his best-selling novel The Kindly Ones, or to the literary search by the off offspring of the perpetrators in the next or next and next generation, like for example the grand niece of Heinrich Himmler just published a very moving book about her family, uh, her experience um, growing up in that family. Anyhow, there are small, scarcely noted exceptions to this rule. One I'm familiar with is a small volume that was published in 94, which from its title sounded like an ordinary book of memoir of an East Prussian childhood. The Boy from the Amber Coast, the Junge von der Bernsteinküste. However, the author, Martin Bergau, does not just describe his happy childhood growing up in, uh, in the, uh, the Baltic shore in East Prussia, but he describes especially his participation as a Hitler Youth member in one of the largest massacres on German soil. On January 31st in 1945, near his hometown of Palmnicken, some 50,000 Jews, mostly of them the majority women, at the end of a long death march along the steep coast, were beaten to death, shot, or thrown into the freezing waters of the Baltic. He also describes these events 50 years after the facts as well as he can, and probably it was his young age at the time which made it possible for him to make this public at all. But what is really fascinating <clears throat> here came to pass after the book was published. Not only did Bergau learn about a number of survivors of the massacre and even was able to meet them personally, but he also received numerous letters from other contemporary witnesses, soldiers and spectators of the atrocity, who in nightmarish clarity recalled from differing perspectives the mass murder before their very front doors. So in a second book in, published in 2006, um, <clears throat> Bergau collected all these reports by perpetrators, victims and onlookers and in regarding it, <clears throat> I wasn't sure what actually, in reading it, I wasn't sure what actually, what I actually found more striking, the degree of clarity of memory in which these events is, are still presented after more than half a century later by people who were mainly children then, all the 50 years in between in which they did not speak about all this, so it was all there. In any case, I think this form of small scale, little noticed <coughs> and highly personal working through of the past is far more impressive and valuable than the cheap sense of rage and dramatization in the context of films like Rosenstrasse, to come back to my introductory example. As I see it, see it the film is iconic for the way our engagement and wrangling with the Nazi period is closely bound up with the media, which simply respond to quite different needs from the big questions in historical sciences. Ultimately, in the discussion around the movie Rosenstrasse, there were two hefty bits of wishful thinking hovering in the air. First, that resistant action was possible and even could prove successful. And second, that it was initiated by humanity's better half, namely women. And in order to keep this wishful thinking afloat in the case of Rosenstrasse, it was necessary to shut one's eyes to the state of documentation and the files. That documentation does not, let me make this clear once again, raise any doubts about the courage of the individuals involved. Questions about the success or failure of those participating in these actions are completely irrelevant for the evaluation of the events and their characterization as resistance. Moreover, the protest action is not devalorized at all by seeing <clears throat> its success in relative terms. On the contrary, those who gathered in protest outside Rosenstrasse had no premonition of the real plans being hatched by the Gestapo. In view of the brutality of the mass roundups, the Fabrikaktion, as it was called, they necessarily had to fear that their loved ones would be deported. And this is why they courageously protested against. And in order to decode this and to figure it out, in order to render visible, visible the different strands of action, and ultimately, in order to grasp the political and social mechanisms that led to the mass murder of European Jews, as I've tried to make clear here, we always need both the memory of the victims and the documents of the perpetrators. But that perspective on our work is by no means something new, and I think we should all be always humbly aware of that, because it mo was what motivated Emanuel Ringelblum already in 1941, when together with his associates, he was collecting everything that could document the reality swirling about him. 
Only when both these assembles of materials are seen together in synthesis can we have a successful approach to a specific <clears throat> to our topics of study, studies. And these approaches, I would like to say this again, should not be divided up along national lines or split up into legitimate ones or let and less legitimate ones or more moral ones and less moral ones. After all, we should all be aware of the limited scope of our work as, his, as historians dealing with any past. And as far as the Holocaust is concerned, I would like now in the end um, come back to the words of one witness <clears throat> with which I want to conclude here. It's an interview, it's an excerpt from an interview by David Boder with Abraham Kimmelmann from Upper Silesia. And <clears throat> Kimmelmann, he, who came from a Hasidic family near Katowice, was 13 when the war broke out, managed to get some training as a metal worker and then was taken prisoner and interned in different slave labor camps of the Groß Rosen complex. <clears throat> he was liberated from Buchenwald in April 1945. And, um, well, it's, you can also listen to it online. The interview took place in Geneva in 46. And I will now read to you the introduction, I mean, the start of the interview. Boder, who's always very strict in these interviews, Boder says, now tell me, you said you wanted to give a little introduction, didn't you, Kimmelmann? Um, you're not so much interested in what we are doing now, but you want to go more into detail about our past. Is that right? Yes, naturally. Well, so, okay, if I... And you want to hear mainly about the war? Yes. Before, when we were eating, you told us that's what some boys <clears throat> from the camp have told you so far, and that they told you it to you in different ways. Like one said that it was relatively good for him, and the other guy said that it was relatively bad for him. And despite that, you said that both told the truth. Bode, yes. Kimmelmann, now you have to be clear about, well, like to make it clear to yourself that these guys not only believe that they told you the truth, but that they are in no position. I mean, they just cannot tell you everything the way it really was. Yes. Because if you look back to history, or if one writes a book about something, people usually say that you always write more than what was. But in this case, like it's just the opposite. You can never ever tell so much and present things how they really were. Thank you very much. Lecture, which, um, I mean, there's an irony to the lecture because um, on the one hand we have your you um, bring into question the authority of our oral testimony, but at the same time we have the sort of great authority um, of your own oral testimony <laughs> this evening. Um, we have time for questions or uh, questions or comments if anyone would like to. Um, I think I can see to the back of the room if anyone wants to throw their hand into the air to signal they want to ask a question. Yes. Oh, yeah, so um, the, what Stephanie, what, how, what's um, If you could uh, uh, perhaps um, stand up because people um, at the back will want to right. hear your questions as well. Yes, the, um, how do you approach the, I'm worried about, uh, there's, um, the example I give is uh, after Schindler's list, the uh, the uh, tourist industry in, in Krakow uh, doubled because yeah. the Americans went to see where the Holocaust was filmed. Yeah. I'm worried about um, my concern, is it might not be in your field of research, but my concern is with, um, uh, with oral, his oral histories, and particularly working in, in contact with the media, and especially the way that the media works now, that these become out of control, if you see what I mean. They become hyper-reality, uh, hyper-real fictions in themselves. I don't know how it yeah, that's a very important question. Thank you, because um, that's actually a, a project that we would like to start in the coming years, because it's not only Krakow, and it's, you can, it's all over, especially Eastern Europe, which does not mean that it would not come over to Western Europe as well. We, can ha we have this development that the history <coughs> of violence, not only the Holocaust, but the history of extreme violence in the 20th century is being staged and framed like a multimedia experience kind of thing. 
Um, I know, I don't know, you, you can, in, if you, there is a museum project in Pompeii where you can go through Pompeii and be there, you know, with this uh, virtual re reality things that can be developed now. And, and these are the plans for many memorial sites now in Eastern Europe. And of course, the idea in some countries at least is not to present the horrors of the Holocaust, but the horrors of Stalinism that way. But I think we have to be very, very careful that history is being converted into a kind of, kind of real. I don't know how to how to call this real, virtual real, reality freak show. And yes, um, there's a there's a, a Sedenka fan club. Are you familiar with, with her? I mean, yeah, I know. I've that. seen her. A sorry, I've seen her a couple of times, and and she herself, and she's gave did, did, did these fantastic and, yeah. and very beautiful talks yeah. about her experiences in the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, uh, but she said, uh, the second time I saw her, she was, yeah. she was wheeled out and she said, I feel like an artifact. Yeah. And it has become, uh, it's become it's, 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 that's the danger, I think. It loses its authenticity. Yeah. It becomes, she, she, she becomes an artifact in itself. She, but she herself becomes a narrative fiction. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very, a, a very sincere danger. Yes, that's very true. And I think we, can, we have this in, in, and also in, in museums that use um, video testimony, but at least as far as I <clears throat> remember from those museums that I have uh, seen, there's like a video screen, you can sit down and watch like a longer story if you want to. In the um, um, House of Terror in Budapest, I was really stunned because there you walk into a room and then when you approach a certain region of this room, you get the video interview of someone, of cannibalism, of rape, of murder, of, I mean, all the horrors, you name it, that people experiences, experience in the, in the gulag, and, but you cannot avoid to listen to it. You are forced to go through and you get a piece here and some rape there and some atrocity there. And um, yeah, I think that's a tendency. And I think we have to be very, very careful. Um, there are three people. Uh, Amy? No. A, a big concern in, in the Holocaust education sector is that in a few years' time there won't be any more survivors to give testimony directly. And a number of the organisations in the UK base their work around this idea of an authentic encounter between the child and the survivor. Yeah. Um, when the survivors are no longer here, do you think that will lead to a kind of a liberate, and that, that can lead to a sort of sanctification of the survivor, that when they're giving their testimony you can't challenge it or question it? Do you think when there are no longer survivors alive, the testimony will be will be seen as much more complex, or do you think there's a risk that it will just become it's seen as a very static body that no one's allowed to interrogate? I, I just wonder what will happen when the survivors are gone. It's difficult to say. I think um, I think it's it's already happening because um, you have this sacralizing attitude and and you have critical research and. Uh, and I think what is missing in Holocaust education is the po political education about what is a democracy and what is the state of law. I mean, all these basic things which sound so boring when you learn about this in school, but which kind of should be able to prevent a country, you know, <coughs> going into that direction that Germany went and others. So um, I think. If Holocaust education stops at this being emotionally concerned and touched and, and, and upset and does not go a step further to the political aspect. And that's what I see with my students. I mean, in the late in the last 10 years, 15 years, you know, sort of German history, the Nazi history starts in 41 or in 39. But all what happened before and how the Republic of Weimar was destroyed and how it was very fast, okay, but there was a state of law and a democracy that had to be destroyed in the first place. This is sort of not interesting anymore. And I think that's where we have to start. So in that sense, the disappearance of the survivors is not what concerns me the most because that's a natural historical process. Like my, my daughter just told me, they were being taught about the 1848 revolution. And she said, well, it's really interesting, but too bad that there are no video interviews. <laughs> I said, OK, but maybe you take a book. You know, there's, I mean, this is what will happen. Yeah. So, um, thank you for your presentation. Part of the citation of the Middle East War. Uh, I do work on the Middle East peace process in 
just a few months ago, for example, we brought the Israelis and Palestinians together in Parliament. I'm interested, to, from your expert position, how these oral testimonies in historical nature could be used to increase understanding between both parties. <laughs> I guess they for sure they can be used, but this is not such an innovative approach as far as, I mean, actually I should ask you who is much, much more in this field. Um, but, but again, as far as the same as I said about children, I think um, the idea that we can only learn and be only concerned when we listen to a survivor's account is dangerous because we should be able to understand what happened and that it was bad, even without someone telling us. And this, I would say, would go for the, peace, for the mutual understanding in the Middle East, just the same for us for children in Germany or England. There's no real way to factor it in. I mean, you create, it might make better understanding of the, say, the Israeli position, where there's their standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, but I mean, this is possible. You can just go to Israel and visit Yad Vashem or open any book. I mean, the, the, the possibility, I mean, there, it's very, I mean, there's, there are many, many possibilities to learn about the Holocaust and what happened um, before in, in the war, I mean, open to anyone in Europe or in Israel. I think the problem is that this, the problem is in, in certain Arab states where this is not being, um, used or being popularized in the media, but the, the material is there. Yeah, but to actually get the people involved in these processes to have an understanding on both sides of this background will perhaps create a more harmonious style of the situation. I don't, I don't want to discuss the peace process now, but I think it, I mean, the, the actual problems and the people who are living now should be sort of fine enough to get, you know, to have a right to live in peace on both sides. And of course, we need to know about the history, etc. But I think actually, the living people now should, uh, yeah, it should start with the biographies now. What I would say. Yeah. Um, the, the Terror House in Budapest is an extraordinary example. Um, and the problem with the Terror House in Budapest is, of course, it was a political initiative from the first Viktor Orban government and sanctioned by Maria Schmidt, who was the official historian for Hungary at that time. And I think that you know you do see that, that what they're trying to do in the political project there is to say that what happened in the Holocaust was as bad as what happened in Stalinism. And that the deaths under Stalinism were as bad as the deaths under the Holocaust, irrespective of the fact that I think it's like 232 people died mm -hmm. under Stalinism and as we all know, 350,000 plus died under the Holocaust. I suppose my, my concern, I mean, I'm a filmmaker, so I rely on oral testimony, so I feel a bit guilty. But, um, but um, my concern is, is the age, really, of Holocaust education. As I've been involved in some of the education projects, is the age that people start learning about the Holocaust. My, my ten-year-old nephew is reading that boy in a striped pajama book, and they learn about it so young, but in a way they can only learn about it in a kind of comic book fashion. And, then, and for that kind of comic book fashion, the way that children will learn, oral testimonies are the only thing they get that's going to grab them. They, yeah. They're not going to be interested in the political process in the Weimar Republic. And that's, that's probably a fault, I think. Yeah, but do you really have to start with 10-year-old children? No. I know that's what they do in Germany. They just had a conference there about Holocaust education at the age of eight and nine. And I think um, at that age you can start with more simpler things in order to say what is good and bad and what you should do and you shouldn't do, like as far as moral and ethics is concerned. And um, and then I mean in Germany it's compulsory almost in I mean in every school they visit at a certain age they go to a concentration camp site etc. And and I think this should be I think you should give basic knowledge and education in school but the rest should be voluntary because everything that happens in a school setting is bound in a group of teenagers you know is bound to go into all kind of different. Direction. I'm sorry, there are actually quite practice. a few people waiting. Oh, okay. You have the problem with Sarkozy and Guimauké. Pardon? The Sarkozy problem with Guimauké, I and mean, that was a huge problem, that he, changed, he made it imperative that children yeah. in the Ecole Primaire in France had to learn yeah. this, and far too young. Yeah. 
I use so, yes. Um, to, re to, to quote your remark, I'm not a well-behaved historian. Mm -hmm. um, and I come about this having worked with and on behalf of Holocaust survivors for over 10 years. From a, the, the, in the role of a social worker by training, helping them on the one hand fill out applications for restitution from, from Germany, but also hearing fragments of their stories, and also trying to do training to help, or to try to help, those who may ha uh, assist older people in understanding how someone in a nursing home or in a hospital can have a strange reaction to a perfectly routine uh, intervention intended to help the person who's a patient, say, but may arouse all sorts of terrors, memories, or fears, right? And, and I think that one of the most intriguing pieces for me is how much money there is and grants available to, for historical <coughs> research, but not that connects it with how, what can we do with this information that can be in the interests of elderly people and younger people mm -hmm. who've suffered trauma in mm -hmm. the present or in the current period. And that um, difference, I think, is a tremendously sad and provoking mm -hmm. thing for just a very few people. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who train as historians, mm -hmm. and given the grants, and scholarship and all the rest of it that's available, I understand that. The, the, the field of working to support the elderly or the teaching nursing home assistants is very much less attended to, and I bet there are not many social workers in the room, because we have a massive wall between the two the disciplines. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on Well, first of all, as far as I know, here in, in the UK and also in Germany, the situation for young historians is not so bright, <laughs> and scholarships are not so abundant. And of well, course, where I sit, they, they okay. bloody well are. Yeah. <laughs> so there are like, maybe you should give the... <laughs> but anyhow, um, I mean, there are, these are different fields, but I think that what is even more yeah, striking and is the fact that, I mean, in, in East Germany, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, all these survivors who were really like suffering, they were, it's not a question of how to deal with them in a psychological way, but give them money to survive or to heat their houses or to get food in the winter because they really were never, never got any recompensation money, etc. So, I mean, if we start there and how, where to put money in the best way, I think it should start to allow Everyone, everyone, and every survivor, of course, to have a dignified old age. Yeah. May I comment one more time? Extremely quickly, if you want. <laughs> I will try. It's a big one question. But the, 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 what I think one can take from understanding some of the, the questions, not necessarily the answers, but how did this all happen, could be helpful to everyone who's ever had to respond in a human way to some story of someone having suffered trauma. And that is the piece. But there's a great undersheet, there's a great gap between where this could be applied to help people, our neighbors, the people who come back uh, 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 from violence or from warfare, and, and, and this idea that is unfortunately sadly um, historical and essentially leaves us all, I think, shamefully like voyeurs, mm -hmm. not able to understand what does it mean when my neighbor says something happened to me. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the UK, it's happening on a daily basis because of the scandal that's developing about uh, the BBC, but it's happened in so many mm -hmm. other ways to our shame and we don't know what to do with it. I think we could somehow bring these fields together if we take it out of the historical and, and mm -hmm. look at its implementation in the present. Okay. Yeah. Well, if I could just, for a moment, Defend history, and, that, and in a sense, sort of take up, <laughs> take up one of Stephanie's themes. Well, exactly. Under, I understand entirely the point that you make. I think that I think what I would want to do is actually to try to underline one of Stephanie's points: is that history c ceases um, to be a voyeuristic when it asks the question why, yeah. not just how did it feel, yeah. but why did it happen, and that's something important, I think. But, but then the next question, so what? Uh, perhaps not. But um, not. Are, are there, so, yeah. 
My name is Gerald Nathanson. Uh, my colleagues here are all graduates who recently filmed this college. Um, but however, we'll be talking on practicalities of the aftermath. Professor Stephanie, I would like to ask you a question. I was surprised by you said that in the opening of your lecture, that there was a demonstration in Berlin in 1943. It surprised me for the fact that my family were deported from this country to go back to Germany, and they disappeared off the face of the earth. And that, in, that was in the 1930s. But in the 1940s, we had this fantastic, uh, unbelievable demonstration. What happened to them afterwards? 43 to 45. Um, that's the amazing thing. I mean, it was, um, one, to be historically precise, it was not a demonstration, but it was rather a gathering in front of the building, and more and more people came. I mean, most of the people inside the building were men, not most of them, and most of the people outside were women and children, and they were waiting for the release of their husbands and brothers and fathers. And um, but it went on for many days. You can, uh, Goebbels wrote about it in his diary, saying we have to do something about it. I mean, people are watching. People, there is a public uproar. I mean, it's in, in the center of the city, Rosenstrasse. So, um, so it is. It's very impressive, and I think it took a lot of courage. Um, and then, after, one after the other, those men were released, and the people they went back to their families and. Um, most of them survived the war because they were living. They were living in mixed marriages. That's why they were released. And uh, most of the people in mixed marriages were protected, unless something, a third factor, came into play. But most of them survived the war. Nothing ever happened to anyone. Yes, sir. Um, to get back to your your argument, basically that you need to counterbalance testimony with documentation. Mm -hmm. um, I think a very good example of this is the Imperial War Museum here and their exhibition on the Holocaust, mm -hmm. which does have uh, video testimonies, but also a lot of both factual and documentary mm -hmm. uh, background and context to it. It's the context in which you place the testimonies, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. And I think they've done an excellent job. Though. It, it, one could go on uh, about the testimonies themselves. They're, they're excellent testimonies, but very well educated and articulate on the whole mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. What happens to the testimonies of those who are less articulate, for instance? Uh, those tend to be forgotten, mm -hmm. yeah. perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's in this uh, uh, dissertation I quoted very briefly, um, she had. Uh, this young colleague, she interviewed <laughs> the interviewees for the Imperial War Museum videotape. So, um, and, and, and the, the woman said exactly this, we wanted the best testimonies. The ones who are most, more, yeah, who can articulate themselves, who can be to the point, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So, they, of course, there is a selection of what at the end will remain with us in the future. And those who are not able to speak, you know, in an elaborate way, or to to tell a story that someone can listen to, and that's so interesting when you listen to those Boda tapes, because these youngsters, they were kids, they were young people, most of them without any education. That's why I put this Kimmelmann at the end, how he ref without having any education, reflecting on how to write history, you can really feel that they had no words how to put it, and that it's all very rough and very. <coughs> You know, um, not shaped by decades of decades of, of, of thinking and dealing with this topic. And then we have many, many people who never ever testified. Yes. My area of interest is. Um, oh, I think I have to speak now. Okay. Yeah. I'll stand okay. and stand <laughs> and the seat at the back. My area of interest is contemporary lessons of the Holocaust for the study of criminology today. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what you think we can actually learn from the past interpretations of witness testimony against um, cases today. So, for instance, like you know, BBC got Jimmy Savile. You have witnesses coming forward, but they're only giving testimony now. 
But how do you think we should interpret? <laughs> <laughs> you should ask. I mean, I'm not a criminologist, but I think it's. Um, I think it was not by chance that the in all these big trials, in, starting at Nuremberg, that um, the courts were very, very hesitant to include testimonies, and um, because what happens at a trial is something completely different. I mean, of course, you always have witness. I mean, the word witness is, uh, comes from this field, but. It, it, it works in a different way. It's not about my experience, but to have to prove a crime. And in order to prove a crime, I have to say, I saw this person doing this on that day, etc., etc. And I think this doesn't change if it comes to the Holocaust. And it, it's, it's the same problem today. Um, but that's why these thousands and millions of files we have from, from all these um, uh, court procedures are very difficult to use because they, especially as far as the victims are concerned, because they really don't don't talk about their experience or hardly. And then you have the same that we do. We just talked about. I once worked on on files from Sachsenhausen, and there were several of um, ex prisoners who were uh, so called Berufsverbrecher. <laughs> they were criminals in the Nazi time, and they were in turn in the concentration camp for some criminal things they did. And then, but still, they were suffered the concentration camp, and then they came out, and most of them never made it in, in, in the new Germany, and they ended up in prison again. But they wanted to testify, and of course, they were not accepted at court. But what they told was quite impressive. But um, you know, they were kept. You know, they nobody ever listened to them. So also there, you have a selection of witnesses. Um, can I ask a question of you as a professional historian? That you mentioned the Freeland of Rochard debate yes. and then the Disburg's book, and you said that we've moved on in terms of our conceptions of objectivity in history writing since the Rochard Freeland debate. <coughs> Just wondered if you could elaborate on that and what you understand by objectivity in history writing today, or whether you think this is old and that and should be left well behind. <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> I think it was a very important debate, and if you read it now, it's really striking. I think this kind of, it was a little exchange of letters, actually. <clears throat> and um, I think it would not be written today in that matter, in that way, but um, well, I think if we take cultural history serious, or at least some parts of it, then as a historian, we know that our subject position is very important, that it's, even though we don't need to be like to expand on this in introductions about how I feel and what I do and where I come from, but I think to make it, one should make it very clear from what perspective do I write, and that what I'm writing is only part is, is my subjective um, perspective on a certain historical, um, a certain historical event, and that and that I'm quite sure that one has to accept the fact that we will never really get to the truth, the historical fact. And I think that's why what is called the uh, history of experience became so fashionable after a while, because it was another way of coming to the core, to the experience. But um, I think we should be very, very well aware that it's only a, a kind of approaching a certain, or putting into a certain perspective what happened. And I think this is some, um, yeah, I would say that this is a difference from Martin Borsha saying I'm objective because you know because I'm German and you are not subjective because you're Jewish. I mean that's what he said in a more polite manner. <laughs> I can see one person with her hand there, and I think this will have to be the last uh, the, the, the last question. Oh, really? I was yeah. Um, hi, my area of interest is Channel Islands um, under occupation. And um, I found that they're not really included in the Holocaust narrative, even though there was a slave labor camp in Alderney, and there were also people in the islands that were deported as well. Um, do you feel that maybe the oral testimonies, um, where they've become digitized, and a lot of them are mainland European testimonies, has almost had an effect like the narrative now excludes marginal areas of Holocaust study and makes them more about the war rather than the Holocaust? I didn't understand it. Uh, could you just, oh, sorry, just, 
No, look, you're working on I'll the ask it again and um, Caroline. Yeah. 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 Caroline. Yeah. Caroline. Um, uh, yeah, so basically my area of interest is the Channel Islands um, under occupation. But what I found is that they are often excluded from the narrative of the Holocaust and instead are considered part of the Second World War, even then, not even within Britain a lot of the time, and considered separate. Um, and I was just asking the question of whether the fact that all testimonies have been made digitised, and many of them are from the mainland European um, region, um, whether this has actually had the effect that instead it's kind of marginalised groups which aren't in the mainland of Europe because they haven't been digitised. Of course, of, but of course that's part of the problem, of course. Yeah. Well. And, and another thing, I mean, all this digitalization leads to what I said before. You look for a certain site and a certain event, and then you go and you get it, but you, it's completely out of context. I think it's a horror. I mean, I think it's, it's really very, very problematic. You know? I mean, you should at least be listening to the whole interview if you want to, at least, you know, if you want to use it, yeah. But people don't do it anymore. Well, I thank you to everyone um, who's spoken uh, this evening, but I'd like especially to thank um, Stephanie for a, a really, I think, a truly thought-provoking lecture, which has made us think, and certainly made me reflect, not only about history in the past, but about the production and reproduction of historical knowledge and the place of oral testimony in that, and, and has uh, certainly given me plenty to, uh, to take away and think about, and I hope uh, you'll join me in thanking her very much for a wonderful lecture.